Dr. Tom Frieden, thanks for joining us on G Zero World. It's great to be here with you. Let me start with how you are thinking about the pandemic today, because of course you and I were talking about nothing but for just about two years, and now we're feeling more comfortable walking around without masks. We're mostly vaccinated, at least those of us that think that's important. Um, and we really desperately want this to be in the rearview mirror. Uh, tell me and tell us uh, how much that reflects accurately on the state of the pandemic as you see it, at least in the United States and Europe and the advanced industrial democracies. In countries where there has been access to vaccination and there's been a lot of uh, exposure already, we're in a different world right now. With the Omicron variants, uh, the COVID virus is not deadlier on a person-by-person -person basis than influenza. And although we underreact to influenza every year, the fact is that if you're vaccinated and if you're vulnerable and get sick, you get Paxlovid, you're probably going to do pretty well with two big unknowns. The first is long COVID. Lots of people suffering with long COVID. We don't understand it well. We don't know how to treat it. We don't know what the future will hold for it. So something to be taken seriously. And second, we don't know what the future will hold for COVID. Bottom line, Ian, we can't predict what will happen next with COVID, but we can predict with absolute certainty that either a new variant of COVID or another virus is going to create another massive threat to world health in the future that we can be much better prepared for. What does it look like for you going forward? What kind of recommendations do you think are likely about the future of how frequently and what kind of vaccines people will be taking? The bottom line is that people should get the vaccines that are available now, now when they're eligible and recommended to have them. We don't know what the future will hold. It may be that there's an annual vaccination. It may be that the combination of vaccination and prior infection protects you for a few years. It may be that we have what's called a multivalent vaccine against several different strains or even a combination of COVID and influenza vaccines. But that's all speculative about the future. What we know now is that staying up to date with your vaccination is the single most effective thing that you can do to keep yourself out of the hospital and quite frankly, out of the morgue. Now, we, we know that we're seeing continually millions upon millions upon millions of cases all the time. We know how transmissible this disease is. In your view, does that make it much more likely that we are going to see even more transmissible variants? Does it also make it more plausible that we could see variants that could be much more deadly than Omicron? I have to say, Ian, I've been stunned by how infectious this virus was and has become. It started out like really infectious compared to other viruses, and then it became even more infectious, and then it became even more infectious still. It's impressive. If you look at December and January, more than a million Americans were getting infected every single day. Now, there's nothing to say that a future highly infectious variant won't be deadlier than Delta, which was quite deadly. That's why we have to be prepared. Anyone who predicts with certainty and confidence what's going to happen more than about three or four weeks out with COVID, frankly, Ian, they don't know what they're talking about. Now, Tom, you said that you were really surprised by how infectious uh, this disease has become. Uh, I'll tell you who else was really surprised, the Chinese government. Um, and I'm wondering uh, what you would advise them to do given what is clearly a failed zero COVID policy in the face of their existing vaccines and the transmissibility of Omicron, but also recognizing how it appears impossible for them to get away from it. So I think you have to step back and look at how China has done with the virus. Initially, there was a clear failure in recognition and rapid response. Their response after that was stunning. Right? And if they had a death rate like most other countries in the world, 
there would be a million people dead now in China who are alive today. They have two problems, at least. One of them is that they don't yet have highly effective vaccines available. And second, they, like many countries in the world, including the U.S., have a fair amount of vaccine hesitancy or people who are not very willing, not very interested in taking vaccines, particularly among the elderly. And if you look at what happened in Hong Kong, it's just stunning. Uh, many of us thought, oh, Omicron must be a pretty wimpy virus, doesn't cause a lot of illness and death. Well, that was if it affects people who have either been infected before or had vaccination. Omicron in Hong Kong represented what happens in an immune naive population. And it was devastating. And if it's that devastating uh, in all of China, that would be millions of deaths. So they're in a bind. They don't have the most effective vaccines and they don't have the most vulnerable vulnerable people vaccinated. Those, I think, are the two things to focus on. Get effective vaccines to the most, most vulnerable, and then you'll be able to have a policy that is uh, not zero COVID infections, but aim for zero or close to zero COVID deaths, which is, for example, what Singapore has done. What are the lessons that you think we've learned and that we haven't learned, but we need to learn um, for uh, this, this horrible pandemic? Ian, people always talk about lessons learned. I think we should be talking about lessons that we'd better learn. And I think there are three of them for COVID. I'll call them the three R's, that we need a renaissance in our public health system. We need a robust primary health care system. And we need resilient populations in terms of health resilience and in terms of societal resilience. And just briefly taking those one by one, a renaissance in public health, we need to invest in public health. We need to make sure state, local, city, county levels are aligned along with global levels. We need to make sure that public health has good engagement with communities, all communities in our society. In terms of primary health care, unless we have good primary health care, and we do not in this country, unless we do, we're not going to be able to detect things promptly. We can't diagnose and treat use Paxlovid, for example. We can't get people vaccinated effective. We still have tens of millions of vulnerable people who are not up to date with their vaccination. Primary health care is so important, but so underfunded in our system. And third is resilient populations. That means healthier, so chronic diseases in good care, uh, tobacco use decreasing, hypertension control, diabetes in control. That means that if there is an infectious disease shock, we're more likely to be able to withstand it and resilient in terms of trust. Trust is the one thing that you cannot surge during an emergency. We need to rebuild that. We need to rebuild some of our common platform of understanding. Now look, I mean, I saw the movie Contagion, uh, and I saw it again right at the beginning of the pandemic, and the CDC, they were heroes um, in that film. Uh, and at the beginning of the pandemic, it certainly looked like people like Dr. Fauci um, and the CDC were very widely respected in the United States. I don't think you can say that today, and you, you've just kind of intimated that. Um, where do you think they've gone wrong, and, and what concretely needs to happen? What could happen that could help to rebuild that trust for the American public? Well, first, Ian, just about Contagion, it was filmed at CDC. I got to meet uh, Matt Damon, Lawrence Fishburne, and others, which was pretty exciting. And the movie is pretty accurate Interestingly, the one thing that many people criticized it for at the time was, oh, they'll never produce a vaccine so quickly during a pandemic. And here we are with mRNA technologies and a stunningly effective vaccine. In terms of rebuilding trust in the CDC and in government more widely, it's very important that CDC reestablish its identity in separation from the White House, whoever's in the White House. Because if all or most of the CDC press conferences are done as part of the White House, then a big part of the country, whichever side is in charge in the White House, is not going to believe what they say. Uh, CDC is in Atlanta. It has advantages and disadvantages. But that separation can be very powerful. Second, CDC needs to follow its own playbook, as I think it's been increasingly doing. Be first, be right, be credible, be empathetic, and give people proven practical things to do to protect themselves and their family. And third, have some successes. Uh, nothing succeeds like success. And as CDC, which is doing great work, which still has thousands and thousands of people who dedicate their lives to protecting Americans 24 seven, 
as those successes become apparent, I think uh, trust can be rebuilt. Now, Tom, you've devoted uh, your career post-CDC to trying to advance public policy, understanding and action um, on the ground in the United States and around the world. I'm wondering, you know, given the target-rich environment that you now see, uh, what's top of Resolve's agenda in terms of uh, where you think you can make a difference uh, post-pandemic? In terms of preventing the next pandemic, I have a concern. There's a lot of global discussion. Uh, what's the structure? What are some funding streams? What should WHO do? What should other organizations do? But I'm concerned that we may be losing the focus on countries, making sure that every country in the world is able to find, stop, and prevent health threats promptly, and having steady progress doing that. And that's where I think we really need to accelerate because we are in a real risk of going headlong into the neglect part of the panic neglect cycle that we see with infectious disease outbreak epidemic and pandemic after pandemic. Tom, I want to ask you, um, how much damage do you think was done, unnecessary damage was done um, on the basis of lockdowns? Um, both uh, more broadly, as well as, say, for kids, for schools. Where do you think, again, looking back on this over the last couple of years, where do you think that there was really too much error on the other side? Well, I was on record uh, throughout of saying I didn't think schools should be closed. Um, we, we knew from influenza that if you close schools, you're going to close them for a long time. And we knew that that would be devastating for educational outcomes and devastating for the uh, economy. We also knew from the outset that outdoors was not a risk. And so stay at home was a wrong concept, the concept of uh, not having close indoor spaces. I think those were the two biggest challenges in terms of going too far. But Ian, if you step back, fundamentally in the US at least, at least half of all of the deaths in 2020 could have been prevented by better lockdowns, smarter lockdowns, smarter closures that looked at what was happening. You know, it's kind of like you see a hurricane coming. You need to know what to batten down and what not to. And then when it's gone, you can let up. So in 2020, more than half of all the deaths were from failure to implement public health measures. In 2021 and throughout 2022, more than half of all the deaths have been from failure to reach everyone with vaccination. I really didn't want to hear about another disease that I hadn't heard of before, but monkeypox, you know, I mean, I'm, there's way too many headlines, it bothers me. Um, should, I, should I care? Well, uh, it certainly matters to people who have monkeypox and it matters to the communities in which it's spreading, including uh, in, uh, in, in many countries, uh, men who have sex with men. It also matters that we don't know what's really happening in Africa with monkeypox because there hasn't been the kind of investment needed. There hasn't been the kind of support for people who've been doing research on monkeypox for 20 years. But there are a lot of unknowns in um, how it spreads, where it's spreading, can it be controlled, should we be using ring vaccination? Um, and because there's a lot we don't know globally, there's a lot we don't know in places that it's spreading newly. Uh, we really are connected by the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, the planes we travel on. Anywhere in the world can connect with anywhere in the world within just a day or two. And unless we invest in better understanding and better control of infectious diseases, they will continue to too great a degree to control us. And that's Dr. Tom Frieden. Thanks so much for joining us on GZR World. Thank you, Ian. It's always a pleasure speaking with you.